my name is Bill Hanetic, and I'm, um, I'm from Vegreville, Alberta, and um, I'm the medical director of the Regional Palliative Care Program, along with Chantal Valley, who is our coordinator of the Regional Palliative Care Program. Uh, we are a nurse and physician consultant in our region, and we have two other physician consultants and uh, three other nurse consultants, along with a grief and, and bereavement counselor in our region. Our region is a population of about 108,000. We cover an um, area of about um, 18,000 square kilometers. And um, so that's where we're from. My name is Rob Waddell. I'm the medical director in the Chinook Health Region, which is across the south part of the province. Uh, I'm also a family physician and uh, spend about 40% uh, of my time in my office doing family practice. We have a, a program that's been in place in, in the Chinook Region for about three years now and uh, have a unique situation in that we have one central city, Lethbridge, with 10 rural communities, all with small hospitals. So we travel uh, between all 11 facilities. Uh, my name is Ron Spice. I'm a family doctor in Claris Home, Alberta, which is 100 and some kilometers south of here. Uh, I am just starting a six-month palliative care fellowship uh, here in Calgary. I'm Chantelle Valley, and I'm uh, from Lakeland Regional Health Authority. I live in Bonneville, which is about two hours away from Dr. Hanetic, just to give you an idea of how the team works out in rural Alberta. Um, and uh, I'm also serve as, I'm the palliative care coordinator, but also I serve as a palliative care nurse consultant for my part of the region. The question that we'll spend a few minutes on has to do with what are the challenges or barriers of developing rural and remote palliative care capacity? And so I'll, I'll um, let discussion start, um, and we'll go from there. Uh, I get to be the devil's advocate, which is one step above the devil himself. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to speak from my other role, which is as a rural family physician, I spend my afternoons seeing, seeing family practice. And what I've been impressed with is how different my attitude becomes when I see a palliative patient in my office as a family physician compared to when I see them in the morning as a palliative physician. So I thought I'd speak from the perspective of a family physician about you guys that keep pushing this stuff down our throats. I'm an average family physician, average age about 50. Uh, I've been in practice an average length of time of slightly over 20 years. I practice in an area that has twice the population physician ratio of urban centers. Uh, when one or two of my group leave, my physician population ratio doubles. So in, within that environment, um, I've developed clinical behaviors that work. They get me through the day. I manage to, to take care of palliative patients for all these years and and what I've learned in in those years has worked and so why should I change those things palliative patients aren't special uh, they're just one of the rest I, I uh, see them on on the same basis as I see everybody else so when a palliative patient arrives in my office usually they're standing room only in the waiting room and I'm always at least 45 minutes behind schedule they arrive with three family members and a sheet of paper that I know represents questions that would normally take me at least an hour to deal with if I was doing my role as a palliative physician. I feel guilt about that, but I also get very anxious when I see that because I know I've got to keep on going. I can't really end this on a satisfactory note for myself or for the, for the patient. I just can't do that. So what happens is I tend to deal with episodes of care. I tend to deal with what they present with in an effort to try to get them home again and off, off my plate for today. And that's the way I deal with everything. Call me when you need to, not I'll see you again twice a week in your home, which could be 30 to 40 minutes from my place. I don't really get paid to do that. There is a payment but I've looked at it and it really doesn't make economic sense for me to see that patient anywhere outside my office or the emergency department of the hospital. It, there just isn't any value 
uh, economically for and, and time-wise. I just can't afford the time to do that. The other thing is, in rural practice, I don't have a social worker. I don't have any other support systems. I've heard about this palliative program, um, but really, I've, I've done this before by myself and I will continue to do so. Similarly, home care, I think, does the same thing. Home care is really challenged by the increased acuity that they're dealing with in, in the homes. They're not really used to doing that. Home care really has a box that they would rather stay in than try to deal with increased acuity in their medical profession. The other thing is, if they happen to spend enough time with a patient who's palliative and decide there are services that are required, someone in the system tells them what they can't do anyway. So it's really not their decision. So all in all, it offends me when I hear about the unmet needs of palliative patients that I'm not providing and the deficiencies in knowledge, skills, and attitude that I'm not providing. So, uh, in general, I'm a, I'm a little offended by some of the approaches that the palliative team makes. Should we ask him to put on his other hat now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, if it's all right, I'll go next because I think yeah. in the last six months, I've, I've sort of, I haven't been practicing as a palliative practitioner because my other hat is a regional medical director. And as I go around the region, I, I hear these same um, sentiments, sentiments being echoed by a lot of the family practitioners out there. And I guess it's all part of what we, we broadly call turf protection. And physicians and nurses alike uh, like to think them, of themselves as generalists, and in being generalists as being experts in all aspects of their, uh, of their role. We often hear we're already uh, doing a good job, uh, so I think Education alone is not enough. Uh, if you don't uh, mentor people, if you're not there as a consultant, and if you're not there to provide follow-up either directly or by telephone, if you're not there to show them that um, when a patient presents with delirium, that when you do an opioid, toxic, uh, opioid rotation, that it does make a difference. If you just give them the education, you're going to fail miserably. You have to have that second level of um, of uh, physician consultants uh, in your regions. In order to get to that level, you have to have people in your regions who are going to be champions, who have a passion about palliative care, who are willing to, uh, to uh, take on the extra training, to make sacrifices. And, uh, and, it, um, and when you have these champions, you have to empower them. And I think um, Neil said it earlier this morning that you have to empower them to be agents of change uh, within the management or administrative structure. And I was fortunate as being a regional medical director that I was able to get inside those, uh, those committee rooms and, and actually uh, talk to people who, um, who make decisions regarding money. Um, I, I, you know, one of my sayings is that success breeds acceptance and this breeds further success. And I think that, uh, again, in order to do that, you have to mentor and you have to follow up uh, physicians that you educate. Um, one of the uh, barriers that we've overcome in our program is that we've provided remuneration for, for physicians for travel time. Because of our large geographic area for our physician consultants to go out and do, to see patients, we have to reimburse them for travel time. The AMA does not do that, um, so unless there's an alternate payment mechanism or unless you have um, also payment for things like telephone consultations, you're not going to get physicians who are going to want to get the training to be the consultants. Um, it's often difficult to maintain knowledge and skills if you look after only a few cases. And I, I agree with Robin what he said this morning, if, that if you can provide uh, physicians with education whereby they can use this education, uh, for instance, if you train them in, um, uh, you know, psychosocial distress, management of that and management of spiritual distress, they can use this in other aspects of their practice as well as palliative care patients. Uh, training must be ongoing because, again, if you're seeing two or three patients a year, you're not going to maintain your skills. And, um, and you have to have linkages, and certainly we've had uh, excellent linkages with the tertiary care program in Edmonton and with the uh, Cross Cancer Institute in helping us manage patients. So you have to close that loop. Um, so those are my comments, and I guess uh, by and large I would agree with what Rob uh, had said from a primary physician point of view is that, uh, that these physicians often feel um, threatened by what we're trying to, to, um, 
to ram down the throats, as they sometimes put it. I guess I'd just like to make a, um, a note about nurses, the palliative care nurses, because we found that in our region that it took a lot of time to build relationships with the family physicians and to build trust. And it was only after we built those relationships and built trust that they would start to basically have a conversation with, our, with us about what was happening with the patient. And we were talking, we were speaking the same language. Um, but that happened after some education, a lot of mentorship, a lot of stepping back when they started getting offended, even though we would have liked to have seen change. Um, and not getting involved, not making recommendations if we weren't asked. Because that led us into some trouble too. So, but then putting on a, you know, an educational session maybe later on. I think there's sort of two aspects of, uh, of education that we're talking about here. Uh, the one is how can we provide uh, little bits of education to a whole lot of physicians or nurses. Um, I have a concern about that, and that is that rural doctors and family doctors in general are overwhelmed by the educational re responsibilities that they have. Uh, there are a lot of now required educational responsibilities, and if you add it all up, it amounts to a, a, an awful lot of days away from your practice. Uh, we heard earlier about how difficult it was to get physicians in Saskatchewan to take two weeks or even to take a weekend. And when you, when you add up those responsibilities and in addition to uh, uh, the requirement that may be in your uh, medical staff bylaws to have uh, advanced cardiac life support, advanced trauma life support, uh, advanced labor and delivery management, pediatric advanced life support, neonatal life support, and those are perhaps basics that are now considered the standard uh, educational requirements, and then you you start start saying, well, you really should be doing you know a, a therapeutics update and some palliative care courses. A lot of rural doctors will get really overwhelmed. The other thing that 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 is obvious is that if you want mentors in rural areas, you need people who are willing to take a big chunk of time away from their practice, which is what I'm doing now. I'm doing a six-month fellowship in palliative medicine, and someday uh, down the road, I guess I'll be one of those mentors. There are a whole lot of other challenges associated with that uh, from my perspective. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that have to come together in terms of, uh, in my case, where I'm at in my professional life, my family life, uh, my financial life, <laughs> because there are commitments and problems that can develop in any one of those areas. Uh, it's not easy uh, to step away from a rural family practice, which is uh, lucrative and pays somebody very well, uh, and live on what our PAP is prepared to give you on a monthly rate. Uh, our PAP at $78,000 is, is about half of what the average rural physician would be taking home. Uh, and that's prorated for a year. So you have to keep in mind that that's, that's a big chunk uh, of, of money that's out of, out of your hands. You've got to decide whether you can uh, get by on that. There's also a whole lot of increased expenses. Um, I have the luxury of having somebody who will take me in in Calgary and let me live in his house. I happen to be related to him, so he doesn't have much of a choice. But if I had to rent an apartment in Calgary, if I had to rent an apartment in Calgary, uh, and parking, and I estimate uh, 15, uh, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers of driving uh, to and from Claire's home in the course of a month, uh, that's it's a lot of gas, it's a lot of parking expenses, it's a lot of rent, uh, it's a lot of money. And so there's some major financial things that it's nice to have the Rural Physician Action Plan, but that's a minimum that needs to be done. And then there's a lot of other challenges that come about with regards to attracting rural doctors who can say, okay, I can spend some time away from my family, I can spend some time uh, away from my practice. There's a lot of issues there that are fairly major challenges to say the least and barriers potentially. I think the big thing here uh, that we heard had to do with things like geography, things like travel time and so on, but uh, the big one that came out had to do with relationships, turf protection, and how do we work with primary caregivers because those are the people that we're trying to influence. How do we create those relationships? Um, the other barrier that um, I think um, The, the issue about making sure that what it is we choose to present to the primary caregivers is the important stuff, uh, selecting the stuff that is going to make a difference in their practice. I think we heard that <coughs> at this time. But 
um, there's a lot of issues that need to support, obviously, family physicians, probably nurses, and probably the other disciplines to help them do their job. Yes? We have a cancer center in Lethbridge, which is about an hour's drive, and a cancer center in Calgary, which is two hours drive. And there are clearly people that choose to go to Calgary, and for no other reason than it's the big city. The other thing I find is particularly true in pediatrics, that they develop such strong relationships in the cancer clinic in Calgary that uh, they feel really quite abandoned when they become palliative and are sent home and, and now they have to come down to this rural community where there is nobody uh, of nearly the uh, prestige that they've been used to. Um, just a comment about that. In, in one of our areas, in particular the Fort Saskatchewan area, which is very close to Edmonton, it's maybe 15, 20 minutes. The physicians in Fort Saskatchewan will refer to the pain and symptom clinic before they'll refer to the physician who is in Fort Saskatchewan and works as our, a part of our palliative care team. And I think that's probably changing somewhat, but that's just the, been the way it's always been done. So that's what they continue to do. So, and it's their choice. They can. Uh, yes. Yeah, listen to you guys. A, um, I guess I have a couple of thoughts. But one thought is that uh, Jose invited, invited the wrong people here. The people here are supposed to be doing the educational initiative right here, but you guys are convinced me that Jose should have invited the family physicians from the rural areas. We would have told him this morning, like you guys told us, that they don't want to be educated and instead of all of us just going home now, they, uh, <laughs> Jose would have called it off at 10 or 9 this morning and said he went home. So obviously, there are some solutions. And I guess I'd be interested in hearing the flip side from you guys. Well, I, I think the solution is not just educating, not just giving them the knowledge, but being able to provide a consultative role and a mentor role. And by a consultative role, uh, if, if you can't be directly to see the patient with them, through providing telephone consultation, ensuring that you do follow up with them, that you're following up 12 hours, 24 hours later, two days later, that you're following that patient through that, that initial crisis, if you will, in the management of the patient. Because if you just give them consultation, if you don't follow up, uh, and if they fail miserably, they're never going to consult you again. So that's one one thing. And, uh, and from the educational aspects of convincing them that they need this educational project that we're looking on. I think the part of that is going to happen because of the consumers. Uh, I mean, it, ten years ago, uh, TPA came out, and rural doctors suddenly had to learn about using this new drug to manage uh, acute myocardial infarction. And part of it was because it was the state of medical practice, but part of it was because our patients would show up and say, aren't you going to give me that, that really expensive drug? I, I read about it. And, and our patients will do the same thing here. They'll say, you know, my brother-in-law died in hospice in Calgary, and it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience for the family, and the support was tremendous. Uh, you know, I now have cancer of the pancreas, uh, you know, what are you going to do for me? Uh, I'm scared and I have pain and uh, uh, you've just spent, you know, six and a half minutes with me in the office and I had to wait an hour to see you and I need something uh, I, and I need somebody to come and see me. And they're going to demand, uh, they're going to demand a level of, uh, of care that, that will force rural doctors to, to deal with this somehow or other. Though in the process there is a period of anxiety and and there'll be a period of potentially crisis where rural doctors will say, I can't, I can't do that. They'll either call upon expertise, they will increase their own knowledge, or they will uh, abandon their patients to programs that can take care of them. And they'll say, well, you're going to have to go to Calgary. Uh, but there will, there will have to be a process because our patients will demand it of us. I think the other thing is that the impetus for them to want to be educated comes from the fact that if you can get in, if you can get your foot in the door, and you can see some patients in consultation with the facility, demonstrate to the nursing staff in particular that you can make a difference. They will often um, um, sort of encourage the physician to sort of consult with you next time, and from that you can actually get them to attend education sessions. We run uh, monthly telehealth uh, sessions on palliative care in our program, and we've noticed certainly as time goes on that we have an increased number of physicians attending on a monthly basis. And again, it's because we, we believe it's because we've been able to demonstrate success. I think uh, uh, Chantal touched on it. Um, what we find often happens, again, if the focus of the education is simply education for physicians, it's not interdisciplinary education, and there's not an administrative buy-in, you teach a family physician, as you spoke, Rob, 
who now sees a vision of how to care for his patient better, but then can't get the home care, can't, the home care nurse doesn't want to do what he asks is in a box. So uh, somehow I think the education and the follow-up also, maybe we need a more of a, a strategized approach in terms of are there health regions that are willing to make those administrative um, infrastructure commitments so that you could then work with family physicians who are going to get the support they need because we do hear the story of I went to the course I'm willing to change I want to prescribe medication in this way and all I've had is flack from home care because uh, the nurses don't understand what I'm trying to do or to care for this patient in the community I need to know that they can put in you know a personal care aid X hours a day and there's mon no money to do that so if we're not careful we will set up physicians to have a lot of expectations when the rest of the health system in that region isn't going along with them. So uh, I'm really wondering about a need to, to be a more coordinated effort. And it may not be that just anybody anywhere can access. That may, that may be doing us more harm than good. It might be what health regions have made investment, are willing to make an investment, and then target those areas. I think that um, that brings up a good point. Theory, the theory of palliative care and some of the education we do is often difficult to implement because we don't have the resources. I can't tell you how many times we ran out of morphine, we couldn't find any subcuhaldol, you know, we were sending taxis all over the region to find medication, uh, we've, sent, we've sent caregivers into Edmonton to pick up medication because we run out. I mean, these are real things that happen in our region. The more we're out there, the more exposure we have, the more we work with physicians, with pharmacists, with everybody else, the medication is coming. But, um, I mean, we had an ambulance bill not long ago of $700 for transporting methadone from one area to another. I mean, those are, that's very real things that are happening out there in rural areas. And for the consumer groups again, uh, education of the consumer group, how do you change the expectation? I mean, though you have the physician education, nursing education, administration is included, and you've got a good plan, but if the expectation of the consumer is such that he'll rather be in the hospice in Calgary, you're back to square one. Is that a problem in a rural remote? Uh, uh, certainly in Saskatchewan, it is going to be a problem. Certainly patient as patient expectation is something that has to be influenced and clearly that occurs gradually and when families are confronted with the need to learn those things otherwise they <coughs> would just ignore it. I, uh, I met Diane LeBlanc last weekend, Romeo's wife, who has for many years been our public spokesperson for the CPCA. Her mother died at the end of November and she has written a letter that said that uh, we have to stop promising that we can do things that we can't do. And the last five days of life uh, at her mom's home were terrible. And on Friday afternoon, uh, the nurses said, well, we'll see you on Monday morning, whereupon she died in, during the weekend. And so the letter that she's written is really eloquent, and I probably should have brought it along. But it, it really pointed out this fact that if we are going to say we can do something, we better do it. And if we're saying, Yes, you can die at home and we'll support you, just ask, and we can't, that's going to create major problems. I like the idea of someone had, um, one of the presenters earlier about the fast, fa fast fact sheets. That's one of the things that we've been starting to do in our region is whenever we come in to make recommendations that we are trying to put some sheets together that we can put on the charts so that the nurses understand why we are doing this and the physicians understand why we're doing it because they don't know and so they, don't, they won't often implement our recommendations because they don't understand them. I'd just like to make a comment as well about buy-in from administration. And the way we were to get, able to get buy-in in our region is that we, um, we initiated a pilot project first. And uh, as always, administration wanted outcomes. They wanted to show that actually what we did in our pilot made a difference. And once we were able to do that, we were able to um, secure funding to roll out throughout an entire region. So I think uh, you have to approach this in a stepped um, approach. And our budget, I think, initially was um, much? Well, the first budget was about $10,000. $10,000. So we've gone from about 10000 to, in our, in our small region, to about half a million now. So. 
I just wanted to make a comment because I hear us over the day talking about what I perceive to be two quite different agenda issues. The education of health care individuals as providers. I also hear us talking about public education and I hear us talking about what I'll call organizational change, which is service delivery and funding model change. Uh, each one of them is a change strategy in and of itself, and each one of them actually has an attitudes, knowledge, skills, behavior change, maybe change in patient experience or change in organization uh, experience, and maybe there'll be a societal change. But we should be careful to segment them out as we think about them. The strategies are actually similar in many ways in terms of needs assessment, what are the strategies, what's the business plan, et cetera, by way of implementation. Uh, both need to occur, um, but don't mix them in the same project, or it may be quite confusing, um, and make sure the discussion is ultimately segmented, uh, because it's quite a different approach to tr changing organizational leaders to changing a clinical provider, and there are different things at stake and quite different approaches. Um, if you want some of the insights into that, that's where the Center to Advance Palliative Care is focusing on the uh, capacity building and the organizational change, as opposed to many of the curricula we've been talking about are about changing individuals. Our, actually, our biggest challenge in this city is that we're expected to take over care, because I, I think the numbers that we have probably of referred patients is maybe half maybe 60% have, have a physician that they can identify that will follow them up. So what we often get referrals that, that uh, are from patients who have been taken into the cancer network and they've had very intensive care for a year or two and, and now the family doc's out of the loop or they don't trust the family doctor and, and we, we have no one to, to refer to for follow-up care. Um, I know all of those those concerns that were raised about time factors and remuneration factors and and that uh, for rural physicians are the same in Manitoba. There's uh, Cornelius Welk, who who uh, is um, a physician working out of the central region. I think in Manitoba is is a point two. Um, I think he's he's found at least initially credibility issues. Same kind of thing that he's kind of just one of us. Why would I refer? somebody to him. I don't know, Paul, do you have any other comments? Just the other issue, too, I think that, that sure. The other issue that um, impacts on education is the shortage of physicians that we're facing, certainly across the country, and that's a, that's a big challenge in Manitoba right now. Um, you know, we, we talk to physicians who say, yes, I'm interested in palliative care, but I can barely manage my own practice. M many of the physicians are, have actually given up privileges in hospital settings. Some of them don't take call anymore, so I, I think it's, and, and I, I hear what Frank's saying about separating the system and organizational change issues from the educational issues. I'm not sure that we can do that entirely, and, and I think that, you know, hopefully we can work in partnership with administrators. I mean, we have some people here that that's our role in the system. We deal with funding issues all the time, and I'm really happy to be here for that reason because I think we do need to build that partnership and work together and take our skill bases and merge them instead of us all trying to do everything at, at one time. I think we'll close discussion now um, with just the realization probably one of the biggest things we can do as independent practitioners is to keep our communication open across the different barriers that we're working within. Um, but thank you for the discussion and thank you panel.